Welcome to this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California and the Marines Memorial Association. I'm General Mike Myatt, President and CEO of the Marines Memorial and your chair for tonight's program. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's special guest, Puneet Talwar, Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. For six years, from 2009 to 2014, he served as the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Iraq, Iran, and the Skull States of the White House and National Security Council. He has a bachelor's degree from Cornell University and a master's from Columbia University. For the program, he will give an overview of global developments. Please welcome Assistant Secretary Puneet Talwar. Thanks very much, General Myatt, uh, for that very kind introduction. Mm -hmm. And thanks also to uh, Philip Young, who will moderate uh, the question and answer session. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time uh, to come out tonight. Um, and uh, uh, all of you from business uh, and nonprofit leaders, uh, professors, uh, and even students uh, who I think uh, came here under the false impression that there would be free food. <laughs> Although I did see some free wine over there. Um, let me especially thank the Marine Memorials Association uh, and the Commonwealth Club for hosting me here this evening. Both are esteemed organizations that do a tremendous public service for the city and this country by elevating the discourse we have on important public policy issues. And after my remarks, I'm very much looking forward to engaging in a conversation with you on, and doing my best to answer all of your questions. When I heard this was a sold out event, even though I do see a couple of empty seats, I actually told my two sons I'd finally joined the pantheon of greats. Santana, the Grateful Dead, the Rolling Stones, all of who had sold out uh, venues here in, uh, in San Francisco. They were not impressed. But like the Grateful Dead, tonight I will take one decent theme and stick to it without a break for several hours until all of you pass out. <laughs> It's always a pleasure, actually, to be out of D.C., um, even for a few days, and to be here on the West Coast. We've had a great day here in San Francisco. We actually got a fascinating tour of Twitter earlier, and I also had the chance to visit with some industry leaders out in Palo Alto and get a firsthand view of the new tools people are using to communicate across borders. One of the main reasons I'm here um, is because the State Department really values its relationship with industry. In today's world, where the impact of technology is rippling across the globe, it's incredibly important that industry, NGOs, and government not only understand each other, but also work together on some of the challenges we're facing across the globe. And in my current job as Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs, I oversee many of our important relationships with the private sector. I also have the privilege of working closely with our colleagues at the Department of Defense. I manage about $6 billion in security assistance that we invest to build the capabilities of our partners around the world, from places like Korea to Colombia. We also facilitate about $100 billion in defense exports. In fact, being in here in San Francisco got me thinking about my own career trajectory, because I actually got my undergraduate degree in engineering. My parents actually probably would have preferred that I get a job at Google or Twitter or Dropbox uh, rather than one where my salary is uh, subject to congressional approval. <laughs> Before coming here, I was actually taking a look at the impressive roster of speakers uh, that you've had here at the Commonwealth Club since 1903. And it's really quite remarkable, from Leader Pelosi to David Brooks to President Clinton to President Reagan. I'd actually like to begin my remarks uh, with someone who spoke here over a century ago, President Teddy Roosevelt. In Roosevelt's time, the world looked very different than it does today. Roosevelt actually was the first president to take an international trip as president. He went to Panama to observe the building of the canal in 1906. He was also the last president to work in a rectangular office, which he was very fond of. And after his presidency, when he returned to the White House to see the renovations that President Taft had done, 
Taft very proudly showed him that he had knocked down the old tennis court and had the Oval Office built in its place. Roosevelt said he preferred the tennis court. <laughs> so times were very different then. The world looked different, the Oval Office even looked different. But one thing was constant in, that fast, in the fast moving current of international affairs, and that's American leadership. In 1911, Teddy Roosevelt said something that remains as today, true today as it was then. He said, quote, the United States has not the option as to whether it will, play, will or will not play a great part in the world. It must play a great part. All that it can decide is whether it will play that part well or badly. President Obama has echoed that same sentiment, most recently in a State of the Union address a few months ago. The question, he said, is not whether America leads in the world, but how. And that's what I'd like to discuss today, how America is leading in today's world. I will speak briefly about the changes taking root across the Middle East. And I've spent much of the last two decades working on Middle East policy for then Senator Biden when he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and for President Obama at the White House for five years. But in my current job, I oversee a portfolio that extends beyond the Middle East. And I think it's important, as President Obama likes to say, to not only focus on the headlines, but also the trend lines. And so today, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about some of our other interests, particularly in Asia. Let me start with the greatest threats to our national security, which emanate from the Middle East. Having worked closely with President Obama at the White House for five years, I can tell you that his highest priority is the security of the American people. And he has been aggressive in taking the fight to terrorists who threaten the United States and our interests. But just as our efforts to combat terrorism have evolved, so have our enemies. Today, ISIL, a terrorist group that beheads and crucifies and rapes and burns alive those who oppose its barbaric ideology, has seized territory in Western Iraq and Eastern Syria. Last year, President Obama outlined a comprehensive strategy that involves working with the government of Iraq, the moderate opposition in Syria, and an international coalition of over 60 nations to degrade and to ultimately defeat ISIL. The coalition, including several Arab states, has conducted over 3,000 airstrikes against ISIL terrorists. These strikes have had a significant impact, taking out thousands of ISIL fighters, numerous commanders, nearly 1,500 vehicles and tanks, over 100 artillery and mortar positions, and nearly 3,400 fighting positions, training camps, and bunkers in Iraq and Syria. The strikes have damaged close to 200 oil and gas facilities, infrastructure that, help, that helps to fund ISIL's terror. We've begun training Iraqi army brigades at four sites in Iraq, and we've helped enable more than two dozen ground operations against ISIL strongholds across, across Iraq. The cumulative effect of all of this has been substantial. The allure of the so-called caliphate has been shattered. ISIL can no longer operate freely in roughly 25% of the populated areas of Iraqi territory, where they once could. Simply put, its momentum has been blunted. But this is not just a military effort. Together with our coalition partners, we are using all elements of our power in this fight because that's how America must lead in today's world. Yes, we're using our military might. We're building the capabilities of our partners in the region. But we're also working to cut off ISIL's financing, to stabilize Iraqi communities, to vet and train moderate Syrian opposition members. And we're working to counter ISIL's ideology and propaganda. This is a whole of government effort, and it must be for us to succeed. Going forward, as the President has said, this is going to be a long fight, but it's one that we are committed to winning with the help of our partners in a global coalition that continues to grow. I also know that you're all keen to hear much more about the latest on Iran, but unfortunately, I can't say a whole lot because our team is still on the ground in Lausanne right now trying to come to an understanding with the P5 plus one and Iran to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. So I don't want to say anything further here about, right, about that right now, 
at this particularly delicate moment, and I hope you'll understand. But as I said before, if we only look at American leadership through the lens of some of these headline issues, we would miss some of the major stories that are shaping the 21st century. And I'd like to discuss one of those major trend lines today, and that's the emergence of the Asia-Pacific region as a global economic powerhouse. It's a region I've been very focused on over the past year at the State Department, even as we remain engaged in the Middle East and Europe and elsewhere. And here's why. Asia accounts for 60% of the world's population. Over the next four years, nearly half of all economic growth outside the US is expected to come from Asia. I think it's fitting to be talking about Asia here at the Commonwealth Club, because California is the perfect example of why Asia's future and America's future are bound together. For decades, the West Coast and California especially has been at the forefront of our economic engagement with Asia. And the rest of the country, including DC, is now catching on. Since 2009, California's exports to Asia are up nearly 50%. Last year, according to the Department of Commerce, this state exported $71 billion worth of goods to Asia, and those exports supported over 800,000 good-paying California jobs. This state exports more to India and Japan than any other state. And five of the top seven export, seven export markets for California are in Asia. So here in California and in the Bay Area, you know firsthand the benefits of trade with Asia. To build on that progress, one of our highest priorities this year is to complete the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which would open new markets and set high standards on labor and the environment for 12 countries which together account for almost 40% of global GDP. Now, you may be wondering, why is someone who works on security issues talking to you about economic relations in Asia? The reason to that is, the answer to that is simple. Trade doesn't just happen. It's security that forms the foundation for a successful economic relationship. And since the end of World War II, 70 years ago, the United States has been the bedrock that has underpinned security in the Asia-Pacific region. In Northeast Asia, our alliances with the Republic of Korea and Japan have helped both nations prosper. We've worked to ensure that waterways are open and secure. Nearly half the world's maritime commerce flows through the South China Sea every year. So you can imagine the global ripple effects if the South China Sea or the Malacca Strait central arteries of our international trade system were choked off. That's why the United States is playing a leading role in the effort to uphold regional and maritime security in Asia, which underpins the global economy. In South Asia, we're restrengthening our security, economic, and people-to-people -people ties with India. I actually traveled to New Delhi for very productive talks last year. And President Obama made an historic visit on India's Republic Day. That visit made President Obama the first sitting president to have visited India twice during his presidency. And even while India is one of the world's oldest civilizations, it has the world's most young people, with a median age of 27 and 600 million people under the age of 25. As the oldest and largest democracies, the United States and India are seeing a natural convergence, not only of our values, but also of our vision for the future. In my view, India's revival and deepening US-India ties are among the most significant strategic developments of the past several years. They will shape the global balance of power for many years to come. In East Asia, my team recently negotiated defense agreements with the Republic of Korea, the Philippines and Australia. We're deepening our ties with Singapore and looking to broaden our partnerships with Malaysia and Indonesia. We're especially focused on building the capabilities of these and other countries so they can help keep trade routes open and also so that we can respond to natural disasters, improve readiness, and continue to be a stabilizing force in the region. Earlier this year, I visited Vietnam as we mark 20 years of normalized diplomatic relations. It's an historic and exciting time in that relationship. We're expanding trade. 
We're deepening our security relationship. And thousands of American and Vietnamese students are studying abroad, forging friendships and exchanging ideas and cultures, dreaming of the future rather than being shackled by the past. Just think for a moment about the transformation of this relationship. Over 40 years ago, General Myatt, along with Secretary Kerry and so many others, bravely served in Vietnam. Today, thanks to the vision of so many leaders, from President Clinton to Senator McCain to Secretary Kerry, we are passing on to future generations a new chapter in this relationship. Strengthening our relationship with China is also part and parcel of the rebalance. We seek a relationship with China defined by practical and tangible cooperation on challenges that face both of our nations. And our joint announcement on climate change last year is the perfect example of this. The more we can work together and be seen as working together, the better chance we have in tackling some of the world's most daunting challenges. As Californians, you know the relationship, that our relationship with the Asia Pacific is critical. It's a crucial engine of American economic growth. It's essential to this city and to the state. And it's the perfect example of the types of opportunities we as a country can seize if we look beyond the headlines and also see the trend lines that are already shaping the future. That's true if we're talking about the Asia rebalance. It's also true for other trend line issues. We're leading the global effort to combat climate change in the lead up to the Paris conference later this year. We're leading the international community in dealing with infectious disease. We're leading on the issue of food security, which has a huge impact on millions of people around the world. And the same is true on so many other long-term challenges. It's true that the world is changing at an accelerating pace. And it's true that new threats are emerging. In an uncertain world, American leadership is the one constant. That's true in Europe, it's true in the Middle East, and it's true in Asia. It's true on the urgent issue, and it's true on the longer-term issues. The challenges we face today, from combating terrorism to confronting regional aggression, from climate change to global health, these are issues that cannot be solved by any nation alone. That's why it's so important that we empower and mobilize allies and partners to work with us to address these shared challenges. That's the smart type of American leadership that President Obama has advanced. As he has said, we lead best when we combine military power with strong diplomacy, when we leverage our power with coalition building, and we, when we don't let our fears blind us to the opportunity that this century presents. That's exactly what, exactly what we're doing now, and around the globe, it is making a difference." Unquote. So today, the problems we face and the difficult issues we see in the headlines are there. But let's not forget that our economy is still the most dynamic and prosperous in the world. Our military might is unrivaled. We are strengthening our alliances and building new partnerships across the world. And we are bending the trend lines in our favor. As Teddy Roosevelt said a century ago, and President Obama said just this year, the question is not whether America will lead, but how. Today, whether you look at the headline issues or the trend line issues, America is in the lead. We're leading with strong allies and capable partners. We're leading with a long-term perspective, and we're leading with all elements of American power, with force when necessary, with principled and clear-eyed diplomacy, with our unparalleled economic power, and always, always with the strength of our values. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. I'm Philip Young, uh, Executive Director of the Plowshares Fund and a former uh, senior policy advisor at the U.S. Department of State uh, under the Clinton administration, and it's my pleasure and honor to be moderating the conversation today. The few questions that I've gotten so far have to talk about sort of um, the larger picture about what's going on in the Middle East. Um, there are some people who talk about that the Middle East is, a, is sort of a mess. That's what I've heard. This is what someone, one of the questions I've talked about. Perhaps it may be a better description, it's messy. And relying on your expertise, can you give us a better sense of what you think is actually happening? Um, we had so many things that are happening so quickly right now, generally with respect to the, to the Gulf states and, um, and what we should be thinking about. The vice president used to always greet me when I would walk into his office. He'd say, Panit, have you solved the Middle East yet? 
to this day, he still asks us. And he was asking that question before, um, when we were in the Senate, before we came into the administration, and he asks it of me today even. Um, so look, it's a complicated region. There is a lot happening. There's turmoil in certain places. Um, but I also think there are you know, a handful of bright spots as well that we should not um, lose sight of. Uh, and we shouldn't lose, ever lose our balance on this. We should keep our feet on the ground, understand clearly what's happening, understand um, our interests, and act on those. I think we're doing that, as I outlined, in the case of ISIL. Uh, we've defined the problem. We have a coalition of over 60 countries. We're working very closely with partners on the ground there. Um, you've seen the recent challenges in Yemen, uh, and you've seen a coalition of countries in the Gulf who see a significant threat and who've actually led uh, the effort well before this recent crisis to help bring a political solution there. An armed group in Yemen decided, an illegitimate group, decided to take matters in their own, their own hands um, and take illegitimate action against an elected government and against the consensus um, as reflected uh, in the United Nations. Um, and you've seen countries come together to confront that, and we are actually providing logistical and intelligence support to their efforts. Uh, we're doing the same thing um, in Iraq with a legitimate government at their request. Um, and so yes, uh, there are challenges. Uh, I don't deny that. Um, but it's important uh, that we understand that these can be overcome, uh, and we have policies in place which over time, I believe, will help uh, bring some solution to the problems. I also think there's an obligation on the part of many of the countries there to also step up. And I think we're beginning to see that. So th there are a lot of questions about, um, in, again, let's stay in the Middle East for the time being, about Sunnis and Shiites. Mm -hmm. um, and there's references to uh, you know, equivalent of 30 years war. Maybe it would be good for the audience here for you to describe sort of the dynamics and the politics related to that and some of the things that we need to be thinking about when we hear different things in the news referring to those uh, you know, two parts of, of Islam? Um, I think you know, clearly there's a sectarian dimension um, to uh, what's taking place, but I think it would be a fallacy to see things ex exclusively through that sectarian dimension um, in the Middle East. And I think if you talk with people in the region, they will tell you the same thing. Um, many of them see things in other terms as well. Um, Islamist versus secular, uh, you know, radical versus moderate, if you will. Um, there are ethnic fault lines as well. There are many things going on um, in the region. Um, there are also challenges of governance uh, in many places that have contributed uh, to turmoil in certain places. Um, you know, when I first went to Iraq soon after um, the invasion and we engaged with a lot of Iraqi leaders. Many of them actually chafed um, at some of the terms that they heard bandied about in our media of sects, Sunni Shia. They refused, many of them refused to be identified uh, by their sect. Um, and so I think there's a lot more uh, that is going on there besides that, but I wouldn't exclude it as a dimension um, of the crisis. But I think you know, it's better to look at it uh, in a broader sense, and also to look at uh, some of the challenges we face there uh, from some of these other perspectives, um, including um, some of the threats that are being, uh, that are, you find emanating from non-state actors against governments, uh, how you see groups like ISIL moving into ungoverned space, um, and some of the challenges of governance. Uh, and I think some of the other dynamics that a very young population that's coming up uh, and trying to give them hope for the future, I think defies some of these labels uh, that uh, uh, can often provide a quick, but I would argue a facile analysis um, and not give you one a full picture of what's happening. Okay. Uh, several questions about um, ISIL in particular. And one I'll read paraphrases. The White House is expected, uh, has expressed a very firm commitment to combating ISIL and ISIS on many fronts, including financial, military, and ideology. Can you uh, elaborate on that 
and what you think, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what is, what we should be doing um, uh, it, to, to, how is that being operationalized? I guess sure. the best way to describe it. Um, there are a number of ways uh, that it's being operationalized. Um, as I mentioned, there's, uh, I think I elaborated on some of the specific military action that's been taken in very specific terms. Um, but we're doing things across the board. There is a coalition of over 60 countries. Um, my colleague, General Allen, um, at the uh, State Department, um, has been doing quite a bit to organize that coalition and to actually begin organizing work around the various lines of effort, as we call them, including the financial aspect, um, including the messaging and the ideology and confronting that, which is a huge element of this as well. Um, and there's going to have to be a lot done. Last month, uh, the White House actually hosted a, a summit on countering violent extremism, where some of these themes, which relate to ISIL, but also are more broad, um, were actually joined uh, in a very um, uh, systematic uh, and, and comprehensive way. Um, there was a lot of discussion, not just with government officials, but also with non-governmental leaders about the need to actually challenge and confront the ideology. I mean, the battlefield is not just, it's not just a physical one. In many ways, the battlefield is in the minds, the minds of young people. Um, some, yes, are gonna go in that direction. And they're gonna have to be dealt with. But then there is a group that are susceptible and vulnerable, and we have to do whatever we can, along with, I would say, a lot of people in the Middle East who I think understand that their future is on the line uh, and we'll have, we'll have to work with them to help prevent that group from going in, in the wrong direction. It's going to take years. There will be a lot of dimensions to it. Um, and uh, it will be an ideological battle in many ways. Okay. So along those lines, uh, one of the things that you're in charge of at the Bureau is developing um, international security relationships with various countries. So let's stay on the Middle East. Um, there was one specific question. You can choose to answer this directly or maybe talk about it more generally. But it talks about the benefit um, to the United States and the region about restoring military aid to Egypt. I mean, that's a very specific thing that I'm sure you were involved with and um, was part of the policymaking process related to that. And obviously, because of what's going on in the Middle East right now, generally, um, because of the potential of insecurity and the things that you had alluded to, there is this focus on U.S. aid and its approach to the region generally from, from international security assistance perspective as well. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that in terms of the benefits related perhaps to Egypt directly or other countries and what goes into considering uh, the considerations that, that you're thinking about because I think people would want to know um, how you're thinking about that and what we can expect. Right. There's actually a, a very um, specific set of guidelines that uh, the administration has worked through and actually put out there that guide our decision making uh, on security assistance. Um, and we cover a number of factors that go into consideration because no single situation is ever going to be the same. Um, so you have factors uh, which stretch from all the way from our national security interests, obviously, um, which are paramount. Um, we also talk about things like human rights uh, being a factor uh, in our decision making and the, and the ultimate use of weapons that we provide to others. We have an obligation uh, to ensure that weapons are not going to be misused and contrary to the values that we hold dear. Uh, and so we have a number of factors um, that we look at um, and decisions um, are taken, I think, very deliberately. And that's what's been done here in the case of Egypt, uh, where a decision was made recently by the president um, to uh, restore um, and to provide Egypt with some military equipment that had been held uh, for some time. Uh, he called President al-Sisi um, uh, a couple of days ago uh, and uh, basically informed him of that decision. Um, at the same time, he talked about how over uh, the, the long term, we're going to be looking to actually transition the military aid relationship um, to one that is directed um, at a handful of priorities that are in our mutual interest and will allow both Egypt and us more flexibility. Things like counterterrorism, things like border security, security in the Sinai, where we have, and maritime security, where we have uh, definable interests that both of us share. Um, and I think that's a smart uh, transition 
um, over the long term, um, and including moving away from a credit-based relationship on uh, military assistance. Um, but we do recognize the situation that Egypt faces right now, the situation in the region. Um, the president chose not to use a, to make a certification that Egypt is moving towards democracy. Um, he did not do that, and that's provided for in legislation. He did use another mechanism, a national security interest waiver, which is provided in legislation in light um, of the situation. So there are several questions related specifically to ISIL, and this will be the last one that I deal with the Middle East, and then we'll move, move to another region. And it has to do with uh, military action. We're doing something right now. Do you feel that, and I, I hate to ask a hypothetical, because I know you can't really answer hypotheticals, but um, the question really is directed about uh, how the U.S. is thinking about the possibility of ground troops um, and U.S. military uh, in that with respect to ISIL? Well, this is going to be a short answer. I mean, I think you've heard uh, the president say that uh, right now um, uh, ground troops are, are not uh, something that uh, we consider to be uh, part of the solution here, American ground troops. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit, just to maybe a couple of quick questions about Russia, since that was so much in the news and now it's sort of gone to, the, to uh, you know, um, it's been sort of taken over by other uh, more pressing events in certain ways. Um, can you tell us what uh, your, you know, um, what kinds of security assistance you're, you, you're, you're talking with with respect to NATO and Europe and mm -hmm. some of the considerations that are going into where you think all this may, uh, going into that process right now and where you think this may end? Um, it's hard to predict the future. What we do know is that Russia has uh, taken um, a number of illegal and aggressive actions in Ukraine, uh, and uh, we have uh, confronted those. Uh, we've confronted them through um, politically and diplomatically. Uh, we've also uh, been uh, providing uh, a great deal of uh, assistance, uh, non-lethal defensive assistance uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and we have also um, worked with our European partners and others to impose a very tough set of sanctions on Russia uh, for its violation um, of international rules, which is basically what's occurred there. So that's what we've done specifically in response to this crisis. As you can imagine, um, Russia's moves there have ignited some degree of concern amongst uh, some of our partners in NATO, especially um, on the eastern fringes of the alliance. Um, and we've done a number of actions there uh, to try to help uh, reassure our partners. You heard uh, President Obama when he went to uh, uh, Estonia reiterate our commitments under Article 5 uh, of the uh, uh, Washington Treaty. And uh, that is our commitment to come to the defense um, uh, of, our, uh, of our NATO allies. Uh, and that, we believe, has had a stabilizing effect and a reassuring effect uh, on those countries. Um, you've also seen, through NATO, a number of actions taken uh, to try to encourage our NATO partners to actually be, try to begin to move defense spending in the right direction. We in the United States um, right now um, bear a, um, uh, a very large share of the total defense burden if you look at uh, the NATO alliance. Uh, and we think it's important uh, that other countries try to meet the target of roughly 2% of their GDP spent on defense. We think that would be a, a good and positive signal right now. You heard some of the commitments on that front come out of the last summit in Wales. Um, and we think it's important that leaders try to move towards that target. Um, in addition, uh, we've taken a number of other steps. Um, there have been, uh, there's been an alliance agreement to increase uh, ground, air, and maritime patrols, particularly in the Baltic region. Uh, and a lot of those reassurance measures uh, will continue. There are a lot of other steps that have been taken to increase readiness of NATO forces to, to you know, not be provocative, but to send a, a signal of steadfastness um, as well. Okay, let's move to Asia. Mm -hmm. um, that was a large part of your remarks, um, I think justifiably so. 
Um, obviously, uh, China is a big piece of this. And so there are questions related to China, uh, partner or adversary, ally, uh, you know, and maybe, maybe uh, and comments about the, uh, what's going on in the South China Sea. So maybe we can, uh, you can talk to us or tell us um, some of the concerns um, that you have and some of the challenges related to China specifically and sort of what the thinking is right now in, in Washington. So as I indicated in my remarks, um, we do seek a constructive relationship with China. Uh, and we, if you just, the way Secretary Kerry talks about it, if you look at some of the big challenges we face in the world, you can't imagine tackling them without a productive relationship between the United States and China. And we've tried to work towards that, and I think we've made a lot of progress. One, where we were able to work on challenges. For example, the uh, agreement that was announced last year on climate change, I think, represents what we were able to achieve together. Um, we also are able in that relationship, though, to be able to talk openly about our differences without that having a cascading effect and undermining the entire relationship. We've also gotten to that level of maturity um, in the relationship. And we talk to them about various things, whether it's cyber issues or um, uh, climate change, as, as again, is on the positive side, but cyber issues, intellectual property, things like that, which are more contentious. We are able to do that in a constructive framework. And that's one that we want to keep um, uh, in motion. Um, you know, on issues of South China Sea that you mentioned, we also talk to them about that as we do to our other partners. And our policy there is a very clear one. Uh, there are competing claims in the South China Sea. We as the United States don't take a position on the merits of those claims. What we do say, however, is that countries should refrain from trying to resolve any of those claims by force um, and that they should be mindful of the steps they take, and the steps they take and the claims they make should be consistent with international law, including the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So with the territorial disputes, <coughs> excuse me, um, with the South China Sea, and even with the uh, disputes between China and Japan, or the, uh, the islands, uh, Sakaku Islands, I believe, are you afraid or are you worried about miscalculation um, and what the implications of that may be? Well, you always have to take that into consideration. Um, you know, uh, you heard the president make a very clear statement um, about, um, uh, you know, Senkakus. Uh, and we think actually that has a very clarifying and stabilizing effect uh, in the region. Um, more broadly, we've actually been able to um, uh, make some agreements on some on parameters of uh, military to military exchanges to try to reduce um, the um, possibility of incidents at sea, for instance, with China. And those are the things that we can try to build on to try to reduce what you're talking about, which is uh, an incident uh, that might spiral. Uh, and I think there's, again, a willingness on both sides to try to do those kinds of things. Okay. And can you give us um, uh, a sense of the kind of military to military or engagement relationships that you have with China right now? and um, some of the other military relationships that are ongoing with the United States and some of the other countries, perhaps like Singapore or mm -hmm. others? Well, they're of, of obviously a very different nature. Um, yeah. In the case of China, um, we're a little bit limited to the kinds of discussions we have, partially by um, some legislation that has been put in place um, after uh, Tiananmen Square. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't engage in dialogue and discussion. In fact, uh, last year I actually went to a uh, uh, a meeting that uh, uh, General Dempsey invited me to, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, with his counterpart uh, from China. So we have exchanges, we have dialogue with them, uh, and that's a positive thing. And I mentioned um, the agreement that we have on trying to prevent uh, incidents at sea. Uh, China also participated in one of our largest um, uh, military exercises last year. Uh, we actually uh, don't think that was a bad thing uh, for them to be there, along with other countries. Uh, and. Uh, uh, so it's, um, uh, it's a, a very uh, calibrated and careful uh, relationship we have. Of course, we have also treaty alliances in the region, and there we have a very different kind of relationship uh, with Japan, uh, with Korea, uh, with Australia, with the Philippines, 
uh, we have a much more uh, robust relationship. In the South, uh, in Southeast Asia, we're doing a lot of work uh, with our partners there to help uh, improve their maritime uh, capabilities. It's something that they're seeking to do. Uh, we think it'll be a positive development. Um, and I'll say another, uh, another dimension of this that people don't always uh, uh, catch. We do have a, a good, robust presence in the region. We've actually used it to very uh, positive effect, um, particularly uh, given some of the, the disasters uh, that we've seen over the last year, whether air disasters or uh, natural disasters uh, that unfortunately seem to afflict the region all too often. Um, and that actually is something that is welcomed by the region. Uh, we're able to work with them uh, to actually help uh, mitigate some of these challenges. There's something I would say, argue, that actually sets the United States apart. Um, that, uh, you know, when we are out there in the world, what we really seek is global peace and security. Uh, we see that as a net positive. We don't seek domination. Um, and people see it not just in our words, they see it in our actions then. When they're in trouble, when they're in need, we are there and we have forces at our disposal. Um, I was actually in Singapore at the end of January and visited with some of our great sailors on the uh, Fort Worth uh, who were called on very short notice um, after the uh, Air Asia crash to, uh, to go down and help in that process. And I think that was very well received um, uh, in the region and by uh, many in Indonesia. Can we talk a little bit, I think uh, you were talking about India and Pakistan. and. Um, we have substantial amount of military aid and aid generally that goes to Pakistan. Can you give us your um, sense of the status of what's happening in Pakistan and some of the things that you're concerned about? Mm. Um, in Pakistan, um, we do have a longstanding uh, military uh, relationship there. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have actually tried to scope that assistance over the years uh, to again, um, areas of mutual assistance, um, or mutual interest, I should say. Um, interests like counterterrorism uh, and um, counterinsurgency, uh, which the Pakistanis are very heavily engaged in now uh, in, the, um, uh, in the Northwest Frontier area um, against uh, some very nasty groups up there. Um, and they've been making a good deal of headway uh, we've had a lot of discussions with the Pakistanis about this. We've encouraged them uh, to also not discriminate between different types of terrorist organizations, but that uh, terrorism there is a threat uh, to, uh, 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 you know, to, to Pakistan itself. Uh, and I think that message actually is accepted, and Pakistanis themselves, I think, recognize that and particularly so after the horrific incident um, at the school in, uh, in Peshawar, uh, and where you saw a lot of average Pakistanis really saying that, you know, that's it, uh, we're not gonna put up with this, and uh, we're going to um, support our government, um, uh, and we want, you know, this problem uh, addressed in a very uh, direct way, and you see it in, you know, polling data, you see it in attitudes, and that's the kind of support you actually need to be able to get at this problem uh, in Pakistan. So I think you're seeing them stay, take very uh, definitive steps now. We're talking to them about ensuring that, that is a, it's a broad-based effort. Uh, we will be supporting with them, th them through this effort, um, both politically um, as well as militarily. And we think it's important uh, to sustain that, uh, that support. Okay. And so <clears throat> with, with Pakistan right now, do you, I mean, people talk about their, about, uh, you know, the, uh, the stability of the country. They're talking about, um, you know, some of the, uh, uh, the radicals that, are, that live in particular, particularly with respect to Afghanistan. You feel pretty good in terms of um, the relationship between the United States and the understanding that they have and, and the support that we're giving them? How, can you elaborate on that a little bit? With Pakistan? Yeah. I think so. Secretary Kerry actually visited uh, not long ago, and he had an excellent set of discussions um, with both the civilian um, and the military leadership there. Uh, and uh, we're going to keep building on those. 
Um, and I think that uh, uh, you know, the kinds of efforts that you're seeing uh, the military take um, in Pakistan against uh, some pockets of, uh, of very nasty people um, are really important, and I think you're seeing them push into new territory um, and make headway there. Um, obviously, it's a complex challenge, um, and it's have to, gonna have to be an ongoing effort in Pakistan, there will have to be an ongoing effort in Afghanistan as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we think there have been new efforts made, and, you know, we're gonna be there as a reliable partner. Okay, Afghanistan, we just had a yeah. visit mm -hmm. uh, to Washington, D.C., there's some, there was an announcement. Can you give us a, your perspective on sort of what's happening on the ground there and the decision to, uh, I guess it was, um, keep troops there for, for, for a little bit longer than anticipated? Yeah, so, um, uh, you had uh, uh, Chief Executive um, Abdullah and uh, President uh, Ghani, Ashraf Ghani, uh, visit the United States recently. Actually, uh, uh, they were hosted, um, uh, the President met with them, uh, Secretary Kerry also uh, hosted them out at Camp David with a large cabinet level uh, delegation. And uh, uh, I actually had a chance to go to a dinner where, where both of them were present. And uh, I have to say, um, uh, this is, um, um, uh, it was a very positive visit, a very good vibe, uh, a very evident effort on the part of both of these individuals to work together. Uh, and if you think back uh, to what could have happened uh, and the trajectory we, we were potentially on after a contested election, um, this is a, a, a fairly remarkable place we're in. And I give a lot of credit uh, to my boss, to Secretary Kerry, uh, for going to Kabul and for using his formidable diplomatic skills in bringing the two of them uh, together. Uh, and you have two leaders, um, and think about this, you know, around the world, it's not too common, two leaders from opposing parties, they agreed to come together uh, and putting uh, their country's interests first. Um, and, um, you know, we will work with them uh, we will continue to encourage the deepening of that partnership. Uh, and yes, the president uh, did say um, and did make the decision to um, basically slow uh, the withdrawal that had been planned this year. Um, and so nothing has been changed in terms of the end state by the end of 2016. Um, but for a few months longer, you're going to see um, uh, a large, a, a, the, the current uh, footprint of American forces to help the Afghans, particularly through this fighting season. Okay. Um, let's focus right now then on a lot of these questions are, I thought were quite interesting about U.S. About domestic and U.S. foreign policy and sort of process here. Mm -hmm. So let's switch gears a little bit. Um, you talked about U.S. leadership, which was a big theme of, of, of your remarks, um, which I completely um, agree with. Um, do you feel that there is a, um, a danger that Americans or um, the America may be forced to disengage in some way? I know that with respect to the work that I did uh, related to Asia, mm -hmm. that was a big concern, mm -hmm. um, that uh, America would decide that their interests weren't in Asia. This was back in the 1990s, and so there was a great deal of effort that resulted in trying to make the case for Asia why we have to remain engaged in American leadership. Um, are you worried about that um, in terms of, I mean, you've got certainly a receptive audience here, mm -hmm. but um, about uh, po politics and isolationism um, sort of coming to the United States and forcing a change of policy? I think there's always been, um, you know, a current, if you will, of um, whatever you want to call it, um, isolationism, drawing inwards. And it would be natural, I think, um, given that we're coming out of, uh, you know, almost 14 years of conflict, uh, to say, all right, uh, we've done a lot, uh, and it's really time to focus uh, on things here and, you know, let other folks kind of, you know, sort through their problems. I think there's always a concern about that. Um, I am not, uh, but I, I think I also have a lot of faith in the American people. I think there is a recognition 
on the part of Americans that we are more interconnected today than ever before, that our prosperity is intertwined with others, that a, 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 th a threat or a seemingly distant threat or a problem in one corner of the globe can come and become a big problem here. And we saw that, uh, obviously, uh, on 9-11 most starkly. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I think Americans instinctively understand that. Uh, that does not mean we should be the global policeman. It does not mean we should try to solve every problem that is out there. We cannot. Uh, and if we try, we you know, may not do the right thing and people may get upset. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that uh, we don't have an interest in working with others to resolve problems before uh, they metastasize and take on uh, different proportions and become a direct threat to us. And we basically know what categories these fall into. We're smarter about that now, I think, and we understand that instinctively. But I think we also understand instinctively that we need partners to help us on that. Um, you know, I saw it. Um, uh, when I worked in Congress, I had a sense of this. But I saw it most starkly when I joined the administration, going around the world. People do look to America for leadership. They look for us uh, to um, help set the rules, to help enforce the rules, and to help guide people. Um, and they want to step in behind that often uh, and be supportive. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so we do need others to work with us. Uh, and I think in that way, we can find that medium where it's not just the United States taking everything on, but we're also not withdrawing. The world would look um, pretty ugly, pretty messy, um, and I think very bleak if it were not for an engaged America. How can the, uh, very specific to climate change, because this mm -hmm. is something that you did talk about, how can the United States lead uh, the world on climate change if there are so many, uh, uh, some in Congress, uh, that are climate change deniers? <laughs> well, look, um, you know, I think you are seeing us lead on, on climate change. I mentioned what we were able to agree to with China, and obviously we're going to have to go farther. Um, you know, uh, Secretary Kerry feels very passionately about this. Um, it is one of his consistent top priorities. I've heard him talk about it again and again, and I think he will do his darndest uh, to ensure that we have a successful um, uh, summit in, uh, in Paris on, uh, on climate. Uh, and I think that uh, we will have to lead, obviously, with others. We'll have to lead by examples. Um, uh, you've seen some of the progress uh, that we've made uh, in terms of dramatic increases in uh, clean energy here uh, in recent years in the United States. We need to do more on that. You've seen some of the actions that President Obama has taken under his executive authority uh, and uh, uh, directing that we move towards cleaner alternatives um, in the federal government. Um, and. Um, uh, and some of the targets uh, that we have set also uh, on uh, fuel efficiency for vehicles, et cetera. And obviously California, um, I don't need to tell you all about this. We have been a great leader in this for many years. Uh, so we, um, we will have to lead that way. But, you know, the Secretary has also pointed out, if every American stopped driving a car and drove a bicycle to work, that alone would not be enough. And the same is true in China. Um, there are a lot of the growth in emissions is taking place in developing countries. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, two thirds of the, develop of, the, of, the, of the emissions now are coming from developing countries. And so you're going to need everybody engaged uh, in this effort. Uh, the science is there. The science can't be denied. Uh, we will have to continue to make that effort. It's going to take engagement. Yes, at the leadership level, but it's going to take engagement from all of you as well, uh, I think, in terms of uh, continuing to keep the spotlight on this. Another transnational issue. Yeah. Um, you spoke about U.S. efforts to protect maritime trade, which we talked about the South China Sea. This question relates more to cybersecurity mm -hmm. um, and cyber trade. Uh, they alluded to uh, recent cyber attacks on various websites. 
They talked about uh, attacks at uh, uh, U.S. Um, banks and financial um, institutions. Uh, these are trade specific. It's IT sector that's important and central to California's economy. Can you elaborate a little bit more what uh, you're doing to protect trade along the non-physical trade routes? Mm. That's a, a great question. And, um, you know, cyber, I think the president recently called the cyber domain, uh, the term he used was Wild West, and we need better rules here. Um, and I think, you know, there's been a, a, a um, sort of a lagging uh, sort of false sense of security about the cyber domain, which I think we're all sort of slowly catching up to now. Just the vulnerabilities are, that are there, and certainly the United States has an advanced economy that's heavily reliant um, on um, the cyber domain for so much of our economy, and we've seen as some of these recent incidents have brought to light uh, some of the vulnerabilities. And it's going to take a government effort, and you're seeing efforts, I think, may, being made along that way, but it's going to take a partnership, really, with uh, the private sector as well here. Um, and the private sector will have to step up, will have to do things uh, to uh, ensure that uh, data is secure, is more secure, uh, that there are firewalls up to prevent attacks, that they have redundancies as well. Um, and you have people working on this from multiple from many different parts of our government. We have somebody, State Department, who was actually a former colleague of mine at the White House, Chris Painter, who's very focused on the international dimension, uh, trying to work with other governments, establishing norms, et cetera. Uh, you have uh, people from our Defense Department uh, who are obviously involved in this, uh, because many of the attacks that emanate from overseas um, often are done uh, sometimes by governments um, or governmental entities. Uh, and then you have uh, also uh, folks in our Department of Homeland Security. Um, we're beginning to, to you know, get our arms around this problem, I think, as a country, and it will just take a sustained effort, I think. Uh, but you know, awareness and recognition um, is the first uh, order of business here, uh, and then begin to build out some of these. And look, we have a lot of smart minds. We've come o overcome all kinds of challenges in the past, I'm and I'm confident that in this area, uh, we can brainstorm and develop solutions. This, this is a, <clears throat> an interesting question that talks about the policymaking process, and which you've been both at state and in the NSC. So it says, does the NSC, the National Security Council, and the State Department have a strategic planning process where they try to anticipate and think through future problems and challenges? And in your mind, what do you feel are uh, in the next two years, the, the big challenges um, that uh, this administration needs to, to deal with? Mm. Um, the answer is, in short, is yes. Uh, there are uh, processes uh, where you try to think beyond the inbox, beyond the next week. It's actually something that um, I think both uh, the President um, and Secretary of State take very seriously. Um, you know, we've had, last month, in fact, he called the entire uh, department leadership together, uh, Secretary Kerry, to ask these very questions. Uh, where is it that we're headed? Uh, he actually asked for ideas uh, from uh, throughout the department. Uh, we actually generated some very interesting ones uh, to take up about things that we need to be focusing on and particular practical solutions we can look to, uh, particularly over the last couple of years, um, uh, of this administration. Um, and so I think you will see um, uh, a sustained effort on some of these. The National Security Council, yes, also has uh, processes underway. Um, you know, their job is often to help orchestrate the work of our entire government, because in this day and age, foreign policy um, and international relations and national security is a complex enterprise. It's not just one agency of government that's involved. Um, you know, I'll give you an example in the case uh, that I used to work on, on Iran. Um, that was a, a multi-dimensional effort that involved all different parts uh, of, our, of our government. Uh, and so you need to be able to orchestrate uh, all of this. And, uh, uh, and I think you see, and I, I remember from the five years I was there, uh, the president was always the one asking the tough questions uh, about, okay, what's next? Are you thinking? Uh, down the road here? Are you thinking to, you know, we're in the first quarter of this game? Are you thinking down to the fourth quarter as well? 
uh, and he was always uh, pushing us on that front. Um, and again, the secretary has been as well. So I think you're gonna see um, uh, you know, clearly a focus on some of these immediate challenges we have to face, um, whether it's everything in the Middle East um, that we highlighted, uh, and some of the, and his efforts obviously on Iran uh, to, to seek a diplomatic solution there that, to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, we'll also have to deal with some of the, the sources and causes of, of, of insecurity in the Middle East, the terrorist threat that's emanating from there. I think you're gonna see him focus on uh, climate change. Uh, and uh, I think obviously we'll have to deal with Russia's actions um, in Ukraine. Uh, and then, you know, Asia Pacific, I think, will be another uh, significant area of focus. And it doesn't mean, because I haven't mentioned other things, that other things aren't important. Uh, Africa is actually a big priority uh, for the president. Uh, he hosted last year uh, all the African leaders in the African Leaders Summit um, uh, last year. Um, and uh, they made a lot of progress, um, whether it was things like um, uh, discussing uh, power issues uh, in Africa, uh, or some of the things that my bureau is working on, supporting peacekeeping capacity building so that African states can actually act on their own to deal with some uh, of the conflicts on the continent, um, helping them build up their capacity in security governance. Uh, and and you know, that might, might sound like an ab abstract concept, but basically you have situations, imagine if you're working on a particular country uh, and the security sector or the military is the only thing that functions, um, that can distort the trajectory of a country. You wanna make sure that you have proper civilian oversight uh, and uh, that it's nested within, uh, that a military structure is well nested within civilian leadership. Uh, and so we wanna work with uh, a lot of African countries on, uh, on, um, on security governance as well. Um, and, and in our own hemisphere, we have things going on in the Caribbean. Uh, I met last uh, uh, week, actually, with, uh, or earlier this week, with our uh, good friend uh, who's a colleague at the White House, our ambassador in Chile. Uh, we have a lot of things going on um, with our partners there, whether it's Colombia, uh, Mexico, uh, with Chile. Chile is now a net security exporter. Um, and uh, that's a positive development. It's a kind of thing that you were asking about, I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. uh, where we have partners who can actually stand with us and become net exporters of security. That is a good thing. So we have time for one last very quick answer, one question. So um, thank you for being here with us. You, uh, we've heard a lot of different uh, uh, things that were on your mind and things that we've learned from you. If, if you wanted the audience to leave here with maybe two points in terms for them to think about um, from your remarks and for you to leave them with, what would they be? I would say a couple of things. One, um, your engagement, um, uh, the engagement of the American people is exceptionally important. Um, and um, activism, the fact that people are here, I think suggests that the group sitting here before me uh, is certainly engaged and active, but your involvement um, with political leaders, making your views known, getting out there, I think uh, is, uh, is extremely important to making sure that America does continue to lead. That's one. Uh, two, um, I think that um, we as a country um, can really achieve great things. I really think it's important that we retain uh, our optimism. Yes, there are challenges in the world. Yes, the Middle East looks very messy right now. I think it's incredibly important to remember what sets us apart um, as Americans, is that we have always dealt with tough situations. We've always uh, kept our optimism. and We've always found a way to come together. And when we come together uh, and we find ways to overcome our differences at home, uh, and there's always been, I believe, um, if you will, a, um, on foreign policy, I've never really seen it as a partisan issue. It should never become a partisan issue. Our engagement in the world, I really believe in the old adage of, of Senator Vandenberg that politics should stop at the water's edge. And I think if we're able to work together, uh, we will be serving ourselves very well. We'll be serving the next generation uh, of Americans um, who I think we have to 
point in the direction of that optimistic spirit uh, and that spirit of engagement in the world. Um, and, uh, uh, and we'll be able to help young generations as well. Our thanks to Puneet Tawar, Assistant U.S. Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. We also thank our audience here on radio, television, and the internet. Today's program has been a partnership between the Commonwealth Club and the Marine Memorial Association. Uh, I am Philip Yun, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you.